welcome to everybody who is here and thank you very much for coming along. Um, so we're on session why GMs aren't green, which I think to some of us might, some of us perhaps those who are older, might seem that it would almost go without saying. Uh, but obviously, all of a sudden, GM is being sort of sold to us all as a solution to all of our problems from climate change through to, you know, how to make a cup of tea. Um, and I think this session is going to address why this is not actually the case. Um, we're lucky to have here today two very, very knowledgeable people who are going to make everything clear to us. We've got Liz O'Neill, who is the director of GM Freeze. Um, hello, Liz. And yeah, so GM Freeze, for those of you that don't know it, it's the UK umbrella campaign challenging the use of GM in food and farming. Um, and so the members of GM Freeze go right from all the big NGOs, grassroots campaign groups, lots of scientists, through to sort of farmers and smaller organisations, including Ladworks Alliance, I've got on here today, and us at Real Seeds, which is my other hat. Um, so yeah, Liz's background um, is in biochemistry, where she says she first came across genetic modification in the lab and was wide-eyed about its potential and then realised actually what that meant in the real world and actually how farming and politics and corporate control works, and obviously has now gone over to the side of the angels, as it were. Um, Stephen, Stephen Jacob, is Business Development Manager at Organic Farmers and Growers, who are apparently he tells you the biggest certifier of organic land in the UK. Um, and he's worked in food and farming for a very long time, um, which makes him sound old, but I'm sure you're not, Stephen. Um, but he's for everything from market gardening through to large scale commercial farming, and now into obviously the organic certification sector. Um, he chairs the Welsh Grain Forum, so he's involved on that side as well, and is also co-deputy chair, it tells me here, of the Welsh Organic Forum. Yeah. Right, so what we're going to do is Liz is going to talk to us first. She's going to introduce the problem, as it were, sort of just set the background for us. We're then going to just move over to Stephen for a little while, who is going to talk through why regulation is important. It's easy for some of us to think we don't like regulation, but why is regulation important? And um, also talk a bit about what the alternatives are to all these new GMs that are being sold to us. And then we're going to come back after that to Liz, who is going to talk about the political context of everything. I mean, it's quite easy for us, I think, to think we don't need to worry about this in Wales. Our government are very sound. It's not an issue, but I think actually we really do need to stay on the case here. It's really important for us not to just let this slide and think this is a problem for the English. What we're going to do, if all of you, I'm sure, have you discovered by now the chat function, I'll be keeping an eye on that. If you could put any sort of immediate clarifications, technical questions or whatever in the chat as we go along, um, and we'll pick those up at the end of each section. But if you could keep sort of main questions, discussion points till the end, and we'll have a good session for discussion at the end. Um, and I think that is everything. There's also a raise hand function, which I'll try and keep a hang of, but you could just mention things in the chat. I'm going to pass you across now to Liz. Welcome, Liz. Great, thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm uh, based in Manchester, so so very much not in Wales, but quite near the, at least the northern bit of the border. So uh, hopefully, hopefully I qualify that way. Um, I'm going to share my screen and just do all that uh, technical gubbins bit. But, so bear with me while I make that happen. And also into it. Actually showing you the slides. There. Is that working? Can everybody see yep. your first slide? Hurrah. Uh, that's brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, yes, and thanks for the introduction, Kate. I should clarify, I didn't actually work as a biochemist. Um, I, I sort of studied it at university, and I think I kind of bring it up sometimes in these events because it, it, it's relevant in terms of, I think, my... I guess my, the naivety that I had when I started out, I think, is kind of what I want to point out to that um, in, in that context. Um, but um, I'm going to kick off um, here by uh, looking at a, taking a focus on the technology and impacts of GMOs themselves, and then after Stephen's talked, I will 
get on to um, much more about the current political situation and how that impacts Wales. So it, it's a bit of a sort of technical briefing to some extent to begin with. So uh, to get on with that, here we go. Um, I think the first thing to be very aware of is that the use of technology around GMOs is very, very loaded. Um, and um, one of the most important things, in fact, if, I, if you only remember one thing from what I say today is that please make it that gene editing is GM with better PR. That PR is, is very active and very well funded. And the fact that you may think that it's something terribly different is the point of the PR campaign. Um, the term genetically modified GMO as genetic modified organism um, or GM as an abbreviation is legally defined. It's legally defined jargon for manipulating the DNA of a living organism in the lab. And that jargon applies to a whole host of techniques which may or may not involve adding DNA from other species. Um, now, older GM techniques, the ones that have been around for, for 20 plus years, are completely random about where those DNA changes are made. And the newer techniques are more targeted in that they're intended to make changes at a specific point in the genome. And that's kind of where some of that PR kicks in. Um, but you know, targeting isn't the same as precision, just because you know where you're trying to get it doesn't mean you do, do get it there. And also precision isn't the same thing as accuracy. You know, think of a stopped clock that is very, very precise, but you know, sorry, it, it, yeah, it's very precise, but it's not accurate. So it was accurate twice a day. So, you know, be really wary of the language that people use. Um, and you know, the reason that that matters is that all forms of genetic modification push us further into a food and farming system that is irresponsible, unfair and unsustainable. Um, so why do I say that GMOs um, are, are irresponsible? Um, well, they're created through a wide range of techniques um, and, you know, all of those techniques disrupt DNA. That's what they do. That's the whole point. Um, and disrupting DNA can and does go wrong. There's kind of put four classes of um, things that can go wrong when you're disrupting DNA. The first is um, often referred to as off target DNA changes. So with these more targeted newer techniques, they're trying to edit the genome in a very particular place, trying to make a change in a particular place. And they might not do that. They might change it somewhere else instead. So that would be called off target DNA changes. You also get on target errors. So you're in the right place, but you do the wrong thing. And then, you know, even if you get those two right, you've made the exact molecular change that you intended, you can still have unexpected effects. Um, and that's largely because a lot of genes do more than one thing. And most traits are controlled by more than one gene. So this idea that DNA is Lego and you can just kind of move it around it is you know, what's really questionable here. It, DNA is incredibly complicated. It's like an ecosystem all of its own. And so, you know, making the changes that, that might be intended doesn't necessarily give the result that you expected. And then you also get unintended consequences in the field. So even of the intended outcomes, the intended traits, you know, you put them out in the wild and the ecosystem responds. And actually the result that you get is not what you're predicting. So that's kind of four very broad classes of things that can go wrong. And actually what matters here as well is that the, the behavior of those who are promoting new GMOs is also incredibly irresponsible. There are wild claims and empty promises made about what, you know, what these techniques can do, but also there's campaigns to remove, the really, really huge successful campaigns to remove the regulatory safety net. And, you know, you look at those four huge classes of things that can go wrong. They're among the things that need to be checked. Um, and also, you know, when I'm talking about these wild claims and, and empty promises, it's really important to remember that 20 plus years ago, they were telling us that GM could achieve all sorts of things. First generation GM was going to do almost all of the things that are now claimed for newer techniques. So, you know, that, that does breed a certain amount of cynicism, I think. Um, the second point that I made about kind of what's wrong with GMOs is that GMOs are unfair. You know, and I'm asking here, why are all GMOs unfair? It's that one word, patents. Patents bring corporate control of the food chain. And, you know, a GM freeze, um, sort of strongly held value, and, and the chimes very much my own position, is that nobody 
should hold a patent on DNA. Nobody should hold a patent on genes and nobody should hold a patent on the food supply. What we see, particularly with these newer GM techniques, is that we've got patents on the techniques themselves. We've got patents on the products. So the foods, the plants, the animals that are producing them are themselves patented. And the vast majority of the gene editing patents that have been published, that have, you know, have been, been handed out. Sorry, I can't remember the term, but you know, when, when they've been granted, sorry, that's the term, granted, um, have already been bought up by the big corporate um, seed controlling organisation. So Corteva, which is, you know, come from the merging of Dow, DuPont and Pioneer, already own vast amounts of these, these patents. And, you know, one of the things that they do is that they grant licenses to use their, their patented products very cheaply or even free at the experimental phase. And then there's a very sharp rise in costs uh, when you actually come to growing the things at scale of actually cultivating. So it kind of looks as if it's all, you know, these lovely little startups and, you know, it's all, it's all very different from all the GMO when it's developing. But actually, as soon as they, they want to bring something to market, it's going to, you know, the power is all going to revert back to the big corporations. So it's very much going in the same direction. And then lastly, why do I say that all GMOs are unsustainable? Um, really, the whole kind of GM model supports industrial farming. GM thinking is linked to the monoculture model. Why, why would you develop this kind of like amazing best super wheat if you didn't think everyone should grow the exact same wheat in a field at the same time? It's just the approach is very much not where we're all aiming at. Um, and also, you know, you're looking at trait based solutions um, to what are systemic problems. You can't fix the food chain one trait at a time. That's not how it works. It's a system, the same as, as the ecosystem itself. Um, if you look at the examples of, of what's been successful, what's actually worked at an economic level, at a kind of rollout level for, for GMOs, we've got weed killer friendly crops. So they might be referred to as Roundup Ready or various other examples where the crop can withstand repeated spraying with the same weed killers or you get insect killing crops. So they're often referred to as BT crops, which is an abbreviation of a very, very long word for a bacterial toxin um, that kills insects. Now, those ones really get me because they are presented as reducing the amount of insecticide sprayed well yeah you don't have to spray it if it's in the crop it's still killing insects it's killing it's still killing non-target species and the, ins the target insects the pests are still going to actually evolve in response so you've got all the same problems as spraying stuff um, and then going back to these kind of newer techniques and what i was referring to earlier is these empty promises we hear an awful lot about the hypothetical potential for new techniques to do amazing, wonderful things. But there are two gene edited crops in the ground growing at scale, um, both authorized in the States. One is called Sibus, it's a weed killer friendly oil seed rape. So it's exactly the same model as the older GMOs that are often referred to as transgenic. Um, the second one is Calyx, which is a soya bean that has been developed for repeat frying in the fast food industry. So soya for McDonald's and, you know, a weed killer friendly oil seed rape. That to me is not, you know, that's not sustainable. It's not responsible. It's not where we want to go with our food. And, you know, that's why we shouldn't even be looking at these things. Um, but we'll get into more of the politics later. Um, I'm going to stop sharing there. And hello again. I, I can't see you when I'm sharing, so I feel like I need to wave hello again when I come back. <laughs> um, but I don't know if there were any queries for clarification or any any questions there, or should we hand on to Stephen and then come back to chat at the end? I can't see anything in the chat, so I think I think we're good to pass on to you, oh. Stephen. Okay. Hello there. Oh, look, there I am. Thanks, Liz. That was really good. I was just thinking, I've heard you say that a couple of times now. It's starting to push the information out of my head. I need to write some things down, I think. Uh, right, so I need to um, 
share my screen. I'm going to talk about this from a slightly different angle. So uh, let's jump into the share. It's going to be there somewhere. There it is. Right, can you see that? Great. Okay, so I'm Stephen Jacobs. I work for Organic Farms and Growers. We certify more than half the organic land in the UK. I'm the business development manager. One of my jobs is to do things like this, but also to talk to our licensees, but also to look at where the risks and opportunities are. So why do I think the GMOs aren't green? First of all, let's go back to the beginning. Organic farming relies on a cycling of nutrients. Those elements are being cycled. I'm a bit frustrated with this constant fixation on carbon, which does merit a lot of focus, of course. But the point isn't just that we should trap carbon, but the reason we're in the pickle we're in, if I can use such a glib term, is because we have been inefficient in our cycling of carbon. Whereas in an organic system, the health of the soil, of the plant, of the animal, and of the people are one and indivisible. That's key, really key point. While we're doing that good work with that field of clover that you saw in the last image, we also operate within a very strong regulatory framework. The production and sale of organic products in the United Kingdom is governed by law, and the governing body in this case is the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, DEFRA. This provides certain restrictions, but it also gives us access to a market, and that market is growing. And in fact, it's growing beyond the general market with sales improving even during COVID. The value of the market at the moment is just less than three billion pounds. Globally, it's around a hundred billion dollars, which somebody told me apparently is um, not as niche as you'd think because it's about the size of the world's entertainment industry. Going on to breeding. Now, I got this from the BBC, so it is a bit simplistic because I think it was one of those bite-sized things, but the bit I would draw your attention to is the last line. Repeat the process continuously over many generations until all offspring show the desired characteristics. Now, according to proponents of new GMOs, that's too slow. I think they're not really seeing the big picture. If if the selected breeds are not evolving in an environment, then that environment will not work with those breeds. I will extemporize. A paper from uh, Cicciarelli on evolutionary plant breeding as a response to the complexity of climate change, that title is really important. So Cicciarelli says, you get one evolutionary population of, let's say, wheat, and it fits many different factors because ecological systems are complex and any solution to an ecological problem also must be complex. This is a very pretty picture. This is the uh, list of all of the varieties used in the Organic Research Centre Wakelands population, also known as the YQ. The late great Professor Martin Wolf worked with the John Innes Centre and crossed all of these varieties. They're not old varieties, particularly, although they do go back to the war. The Maris Widgeon came out just after the Second World War, for instance. But they all have a parental line that leads to a biodiverse crop. What does that mean? That is a picture from Mark Lee, who farms in Shropshire. He's uh, licensed organic with OFNG. Mark is... Uh, very rightly proud of that picture. I asked him if I could use it. He said he's never taken a better one. 
On the right, with all those pretty poppies, those are strips of modern wheat that Mark, Mark was trialing. On the left, where there's very few, almost no poppies, just near the tree, that's the YQ. That's the Wakelings population. The point of this photograph is to show you that the YQ outcompetes weeds. Mark, as I say, is organic, so he's not using any chemicals to suppress weeds. He's not using chemicals brought in in order to fertilize the crop. What he's got there is a stable crop of good quality wheat that is millable to make good quality bread. On the right, we've got some pretty poppies, but we've got an economic nightmare for a farm. We can go back to, let's say, the, um, the beginning, the birth of, the, of civilization. It's called the, the Fertile Crescent around sort of um, Mesopotamian times. So these images from Ed Dickin, who's a crops uh, breeder, but also lecturer at Harper Adams University. So you can see the one with the long strands coming off, that's einkorn, that's an ancient wheat, one of the early first developed wheats by uh, civilized humans, so-called civilized humans. And next to it is a more modern one. And you can see the more modern one's got those big fat grains on it. Now, that looks great. You're getting more grain. But if you look at the image on the right, you're getting less root. So in their efforts to breed, conventional breeding, not using GNOs, conventional breeding has gone away from an evolutionary pathway. So when Defra says that new GMOs are like traditional breeding, that's what they're talking about. They're talking about persisting in a line away from understanding the complexities of the ecological landscape they expect us to grow the food in. I'm sure I don't need to say to this audience what that catastrophe will then unfold. Uh, these pictures from Rob Penn. Rob is growing uh, and he's also an author based in South Wales, near Betis, uh, just above Abergavenny. And the one on the left is Yeoman, as it says there, it, it was from around the time of the First World War. Um, and there's Rob on the right with a, 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 his own crop that he's grown, uh, and not two Gilchesters, who are an organic mill up in uh, Northumberland. And that's the product. This is what it's all about, folks. Look at that tasty bread. Gorgeous. I can almost smell it. The quality of this food is way, way above the average. And I would sooner that this was the average. I've just thrown this slide in while Liz was talking because it reminded me of the fact that I haven't done this before. This is from Phil Howard. I can put a, a, a note in the chat. This is the ownership and consolidation of ownership of seed across the world. Essentially, there are now three companies, Bayer, Corteva and Camjohn. This is not a healthy situation. And without regulation, it can be very, very dangerous. So speaking of regulation, we asked for a little while ago, I think it was 2014, what their measures on coexistence were. They said that they weren't expecting GM crops to be grown here commercially for several years. So they didn't have any immediate plans. The conversation went on a bit longer. It has restarted. They said that they would introduce pragmatic, proportionate coexistence measures in due course. Well, we'll see. We responded, OFNG did, along with other groups to the government's um, consultation recently on gene editing and on the role of regulation. What we want is a robust regulation with risk assessments we want it to be transparent and we want it to be 
to stand up to scrutiny. As Liz has said before, who's going to check whose homework? The organic sector successfully developed on the basis of a really high level of trust, right the way through the chain, from the seed breeders through to the shoppers. And we will be robust in protecting this relationship. What's my worry? Well, there was a project uh, across Europe looking at coexistence. Additional commodity costs are the most relevant factor, it says, and you can see that last line, the most relevant additional costs this is talking about are born not at the seed man of, uh, developer, not at the retailer, with the farmer. What are the issues? One of the issues in this report was about herbicide resistant plants and seeds being detected along the route of transport. So they weren't even being grown there, they leaked out. This one with the Swiss border, they found that uh, oil seed rape plants have, were growing up along where the railway siding was. Why is this a problem? Well, if they're herbicide resistant, that's a problem because it's herbicides the authorities use to keep those plants from destabilizing the railway. That's just one instance, I could go on, we don't have time, of why we need to be careful. Here's another, just a uh, last slide really. We need to have regulatory oversight because we cannot always just trust that people are selling what they say they're selling, that they're not doing what they say they're doing. I looked into the history of the horse meat scandal, and it turned out that it was only picked up, or at least it was initially picked up, because of sloppy storage. Otherwise, it would have gone on a lot longer. So that's the end of my little talk for now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stephen. So. Yeah, there's some nice comments coming up in the chat, but I think we'll come back to those at the end. So unless there's any sort of immediate clarification, then I'm going to pass back to Liz. We can do that. Yeah, I think okay, we'll, we'll do we'll do the fun bit of swapping PowerPoints. Hang on a moment, bear with us. It's always the hardest bit, isn't it? Uh, Make sure it actually runs as a presentation. There we go. That looks like we're in business. All look looks good. good. Excellent. Right. So, yes, um, you're back to me um, for a few words on current regulation, um, political context, the immediate threats um, on GM regulation and why that all matters in Wales. And I will close with some thoughts on how you can all help. Uh, so current regulation. Uh, current GM regulation is, is far from perfect, um, but it, it's what was called retained EU law. So that means it's regulation that, that was passed in the EU that we sort of had all these, these little, you know, um, behind the scenes processes to convert into UK law. Um, and so we're still following the EU regulations. And what they mean is that no GMOs can be released without case by case risk assessments. They're theoretically independent. I tend to say they are independent-ish in that they're not done um, by the people who develop them, but they, they could be a lot better. Um, there's traceability and post-release monitoring, and that, above all else, will facilitate recall. So if something goes wrong later, if you find you know, that something isn't as, as it should be, then we can find this stuff um, you know, throughout the food chain. And also labelling that allows us to choose what we buy and eat, whether we want to include GMOs in our diet. Um, now, theoretically, there are also rules on containment and contamination, but, you know, as Stephen touched on, they're not at all well developed. Um, certainly the UK government is not ready for that. So um, it seems very unlikely that any of the other, um, the devolved nation governments will be either because, you know, they're not planning on authorising any of it. So... Uh, it's important to consider a bit of general political context um, 
And I think the overriding point here is that, that there is an ideological push to reduce public protections across the board. This isn't just about GM, but on Boris Johnson's first day as Prime Minister, him having, I don't think, ever spoken about GM publicly before, he announced that he plans to liberate the UK's extraordinary bioscience sector from anti-genetic modification rules, um, which was a bit of a surprise and doesn't kind of really make a lot of sense. Um, also, on the left of that slide, you've got the cover of um, a report um, known as the a report from the Task Force on Innovation, Growth and Regulatory Reform. And um, this is a big project that was led by Ian Duncan Smith. Uh, make of that what you will. Um, and make of the design of the cover what you will about the context of all this. Um, it's sometimes referred to as the Tigger Report. And in that, one of their key recommendations is that the UK government should actively support research into and commercial adoption by UK farmers and growers of gene edited crops. So they're making an overt political statement that they, that they want more research and they want more adoption. Um, now, all of this, both Boris Johnson and the Tigger Report, are about creating a Brexit win. This is about the idea that Brexit has freed the UK up to you know, do something different on GM. And the incredibly important point that is very deliberately you know, not pulled to the board all of this is that GM is already legal. You, can, you just have to go through a process to get stuff authorised. It's not banned. Even in Wales, the actual process is not banned. Certain crops have been banned. Um, so what this is about is removing safeguards and, and having you know, a complete free reign. Um, I've got a little map there, um, also on the side, just really to depict devolution. I'll, I'll come back to that in more detail, specifically looking at Wales. But, you know, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland all have very different policy approaches to GM to the Westminster government. So that's just important to bear in mind. Um, so what are the immediate threats? Why, why are Stephen and I doing the rounds of these conferences? Apologies to anyone who's seen all these slides before at some of the others, but you know, why are we putting so much effort into this right now? Um, on the 29th of September, George Eustace, the Environment Secretary, announced plans to remove some GM field trials from the scope of public protections. Now that will mean that they don't require um, any particular consent. They just have to inform DEFRA that they're doing it. There won't be an independent risk assessment. There won't be any monitoring or requirement for containment um, of those field trials. And I don't know yet, but I, what I fear is that there may be no restrictions or fewer restrictions on the size of what counts as a field trial. What counts at the moment is relatively small. Um, and I think if they're not requiring consent, it's gonna be very difficult for any, any you know, if there is theoretically a restriction, it'd be very hard to actually enforce it if there's no requirement for consent. So that change is going to apply to plants that were produced by genetic technologies where the resulting genetic changes could have been developed using traditional breeding methods. Now, if that sounds like something that you're, you can't get your head around, you're right. It's absolute nonsense it has no scientific basis whatsoever um the roslin institute who are the, the people behind dolly the sheep and they're also very engaged in the development of um, gene editing techniques in farmed animals described that very just that very definition as exceptionally challenging and the royal society who were quoted as being all for you know um the the, the removal of these regulatory safeguards described again that definition as problematic um, and those comments were made as part of DEFRA's consultation this year which Stephen mentioned um, and I'm sure that lots of you engaged with you know we have had great take up on that um, that consultation um, result was actually released I think nine hours after the embargo lifted on Eustace's announcement about the new plans um, and it's easy to see why he held back because 88% of individuals and 64% of businesses that engaged in that consultation said that they opposed all plans to remove GM safeguards from new gene editing GM techniques. So the consultation told them not to do the thing. And of course, they're doing the thing. 
Um, they're starting with the field trials, but they've been very, very clear that that is just the start, that they will roll it out to cultivation as soon as they, they, they can manage to do so. Um, that first change is going to happen in a very quiet way with what's called a statutory instrument, which is going to make it much more difficult for us to, to, to try and stop it. Um, it is relatively small in the impact that it's going to have, but it's going to set a precedent in law. It's going to put that completely meaningless definition into a legal regulation, and that's very, very worrying. They're also testing what they can get away with. So even though it's going to be very hard to stop it, we need to make a lot of noise around what they're planning to do. Now, all of what I've just said there only applies in England, sort of. So why does it matter? Why have I come to a Welsh conference to talk about this? Um, yes, those changes only apply in England because agriculture is a devolved competency. Um, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland all have much more GM sceptical policies than the UK government in Westminster. But, you know, the Welsh government's resolve on this is actually untested um, and the EU is slowly moving in the similar direction. So if their priority is about, you know, retaining alignment with the EU, then we might lose some of that strength. They're saying useful things and they are very much an ally at the moment. But, you know, I don't know where their line is. And I don't think we will know until we reach it. Um, the other thing, as you know, the really obvious thing is if you look at this sign, you know, the Welcome to Wales sign. I don't, I, I'm sorry, I don't actually know where that is. I just found it online. But, you know, it's between two fields. Seed and pollen don't respect national boundaries. Do you know, if it's, if it's not legally GM in England, you won't even know. So if, they grow, if someone is able to grow a genetic crop in England um, and not have it have it be GM. There'll be no measures to prevent contamination. And, you know, I've included that border there because I'm sure many of us have, have been on those roads that cross the border between England and Wales like every five minutes. There's just not going to be a way of stopping this if England classes it as non-GM because none of those measures will be in place. To eat more broadly, most of the food chain operates on a UK or a GB basis, at least rather than separately, England and Wales. And even where things can operate separately, the Internal Markets Act, um, which is a piece of legislation that went through about a year ago, will prevent Wales putting up any barriers to the sale of English products. So if a product of a food with a, a GMO in it is allowed to be sold in England, it can be not allowed to be produced in Wales, not allowed to be grown in Wales, but you can't in Wales stop people selling the English products. You can't put a barrier up. So that's a really problematic piece of context. Um, I've kind of just gone very slightly over my time, but I hope that you will, will, will um, bear with me just while I kind of do my plea to get involved. Um, it really is time to be active on this again. I know a lot of people on the call were probably engaged 20 years ago, 10 years ago even, and things have gone a little quieter on GM, but they have to be noisy now. Um, you know, the real food and farming movement is creating and promoting the alternative food system that we all need. But if that movement doesn't get behind fighting what we're against, fighting this GMO threat, we're going to really struggle. It is coming. There's a tiny, tiny number of campaigners working on it, which is why it's always me, you know, doing lots of these conferences recently. We can't win this on our own and we need you behind us. The three things that I want you to do, the first is a don't, so, you know, don't believe the hype, don't repeat it. If you want to remember one thing from what I've said today, gene editing is GM with better PR. Make that clear in ev every time you talk about it. Um, Sign up for GM Freeze emails. Um, that's because a lot of this political stuff moves terribly quickly. So if we can email you and ask you to write to your, your MP um, or you know, other elected representatives, then you, know, you can do that with what's happening in the moment. And also share this, share in your network. I, I can come and do this talk at another event. I can provide briefings, I can provide advice. I want to work with you, but you, know, you need to reach out and talk to us. And I will put lots of links in the chat. So I'll stop sharing and hand back to Kate. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Liz and Stephen. I mean, yes, it's one of these things where it's almost very 
depressing that we're back here again because it felt like we'd won a battle and now it's just come straight back again. And I think that's a reflection of the strength and the power of these corporations is that they will just come back and back and back and we have to not let them get away with it, essentially. We have to keep taking action. Um, what I'm going to do now, I'm just going to go through, there's been some great points and questions in the chat. So I'm going to go through those. An excellent point. Um, I'm just scrolling back, apologies for this. Um, really good point being made that, you know, this point that we mustn't forget that there are really great alternatives. We don't need this, this sort of corporate useless seed that is just sold to make money and won't help any of us. Um, good point that traditional varieties are genetically diverse, meaning they can adapt to changing environmental factors, which is particularly important for small traditional growers who keep their own seed. And that's Sharon who's saying that. There is, I, I, just to come in on that, there is a strong point needs to be made as well. That, and this is something that Kate and Real Seeds have done really well. Is it's it's not just that it's it's not okay to just go for older varieties or open source varieties. You've got to look after making sure that they germinate like you say they will, that they're not passing on disease, etc. And so there's still a very, there's a need for us not to be too 1960s about all of this. You know, let's just, you know, throw out the baby with the bathwater to use an old phrase. But we need to have a robust seed regulatory framework, but we also need really strong seed breeding. Yeah. And, and that's, that's an issue that we currently, we, we're struggling with. Yeah, I think that is something that is really, really important is that we need funds and research and time to be going into traditional seed breeding, proper seed breeding, if we can put it that way, that will actually benefit everybody. Um, and there's some great stuff happening on the continent. We should be doing that here. I think that's something we must remember. Um, it's all about resilience. I mean, that is the point that Liz has made, isn't it? That what we need is resilience, and these are the opposite of resilient. Um, Stephen has put some great links in the chat, which I would urge you all to follow up on. So, yeah, we've got, I'm just picking up. So, um, Jane Ricketts is asking Is there any significance to the Welsh Government's declaration and subsequent re declaration of GM Free Nation then? And I'm going to throw that to. Liz, maybe? Liz and Stephen. That, that's fine. I think, yes, that absolutely is significant. I mean, the, the fact they're willing to do it is, is very, very significant. It, it uh, makes a very clear point of difference with, with Westminster. What worries me is, is any idea that that means it, it will all be OK. I mean, I live in, I live in Manchester, which declared itself nuclear free. Um, however many years ago, you're like, well, yeah, people don't tend to actually put nuclear power stations or, you know, missiles in the middle of a big city. So, you know, it's great. It makes a point. It's really nice. I feel good about it. But actually, they don't have a lot of power to stop it. Now, the Welsh Government has a lot more power over their agriculture than the Manchester City Council has over, you know, nuclear weapons. But you know they are operating within a wider context they're operating within that that well i mean let's face it westminster you know treats them as, as little more than a local council don't they so westminster will run roughshod over it where they can and what what i get do you know what i'm going to be really political here what worries me a little bit sometimes with this stuff is that it plays quite well for um, nationalists to be out of set and to kind of be annoyed with Westminster. This is more of an issue with Scotland, but actually, you know, Westminster really making it hard for Scotland plays really well into having a second independence referendum. So you kind of, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's super important, it's super helpful, but we really need to try and work with them and I think it's really important that everybody living in Wales writes to, engages with their elected representatives, that, you know, we can get as much access as we can politically, because they can't do this on their own. They can't, you know, they, they can't just put a big net up and stop the stuff coming. Um, and the impact of the Internal Markets Act is potentially very, very significant on holding that line. 
No, I'll, I'll, I'll add to that if I may. Eustace was asked about this a little while ago, and he said, "Well, they can stop stop it being grown in Wales, but they can't stop it coming over the border in a wrapper, meaning the food." Yeah, I think so, that is the key point, isn't it? That we, yeah. we're going to have this on our shelves if we don't stop it at a UK level. And I think we want to make it clear that if you if you don't agree with this, and if you do agree with it, I'm happy to have a chat with you sometime because I mm. just can't understand why anybody would support this, unless, of course, they were working for one of the companies involved, is that uh, we need to make it clear to shops and to producers and others in the supply chain that we don't want it. Yeah. And the reason we don't want it is because it doesn't work. It's not doing what they say it will do. And actually, what we really should be doing is putting resource into a really good seed breeding network that would work with ecological complexity. Yeah, I mean, another point is being made here in a chat um, by Hal. Um, thank you for this. Is that an interesting point was made um, legally when they're discussing Wellbeing of Future Generations Act and it's saying that the Welsh legislation is heard in a non-devolved judiciary so actually that is another limitation I don't it's, really well, it's something that. just before Liz comes on to that I did look into this with colleagues in mainland Europe and we started looking at German tort law t-o-r-t law which is a common law that then becomes law uh, and it's on the statute book. And I think, yeah, there could be an interesting angle there. That whole thing about the future of well-being, well-being of future generations act and whether it has legal weight, it, it does require testing in court, but that's how law is established through precedent. Mm. Yeah. Now, it's a tricky one, isn't it? And it, but it's, 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 it's the key point is that actually we can keep it from being grown, but what else, you know, the internal markets act is an absolute killer, wider. Okay, do we have any other questions? Point being made that NFU has been very much in favor of GM. And um, it's something that we've tried to discuss. So I have, well, Liz and I were on a panel with Tom Bradshaw a little while ago, who's the NFU vice president, at the moment's vice president. <laughs> Um, and Tom has slightly altered his language, hasn't he, Liz? He, he now accepts that this is not a quick fix. It's not a silver bullet. And then he uses that phrase that, that really grinds my gears, which is we've got to have all the tools in the toolbox. But of course, the toolbox, if it's ignorant of ecological complexity, is about as much use as a chocolate teapot. So uh, I sit on the NFU Organic Forum uh, and we are pushing the point as best we can. The forum doesn't have any policy powers. And with Hayden on the Welsh Organic Forum, we push it to Welsh government who are a lot more receptive. Although I take, I think it was um, Sharon's point that the Welsh government can sometimes give it a lot of talk. We need to get them to do the walk as well. There's a question from Ronnie, Ronnie Roberts here, um, regarding GM vaccines for COVID and people using that argument as a way to push GM in food. And Liz, I think you said you could come back yeah, on that one. For yeah, me. I mean, I think it's, this does come up um, and, you know, I'm not going to get into the, the vaccine discussion. I'm sure we, we all kind of have our own, our own views on that. I'm happy to... to um, reveal that I, I and every other member of my family are vaccinated and, and enthusiastically so. Um, but, you know, obviously respect other people's choices. This does come up and I think it's really important that people are able to answer it. I would never kind of start a conversation about this, but if you're asked directly and, and this is this idea that was somehow terribly hypocritical, but the, the two processes are very, very different. Not the technical, you know, molecular process. That's very similar. They are using the same, you know, clever bits of science. But even a vaccine that is, you know, had a very quick authorization process went through a series of checks that, you know, leave anything that happens in food and farming you know, high and dry, they, they, oh, I'm not getting a very good metaphor there, but they, they do massively more checking. It's done by, by a, a number of different independent bodies. There are hugely detailed protocols. There are, you know, live trials. Um, 
and all of that happens before it goes out and then it's administered by a health professional on an individual basis with that individual's consent whereas what happens with you know gm agriculture particularly with crops is it goes in a field the pollen the seed is just there all over the place and you know anyone who like me lives in a, in a city but has hay fever can tell you pollen travels a long way um and you know we, so we can't give or withdraw our consent to that and we also if it's not labeled if it's not identifiable which it won't be if it's not classified as a gm we can't give our consent we can't have a choice about what we do with our food so I think that argument that, oh, you know, you've had the vaccine, so, so you're a hypocrite, that relies on the notion that we object to this because we're somehow afraid of the science. You know, there may be people who have an ideological concern about any manipulation of DNA, and they may choose not to have the vaccine, but they can make that choice. Actually, the, the body of what's wrong with GM in food and farming is much more, you know, it's, it's dominated, I would say, much more by you know, how it's used, who owns it, how it's applied, and this massive factor that it is not being properly checked, that they want to check their own homework. So you know, why would you not want somebody checking that the really complicated science thing you've done has gone right? Like, you know, that's just mind boggling. So yeah, sorry, I get a bit passionate about that one. <laughs> no, I agree. I completely agree. And this is the thing is that we've said, but regulatory frameworks aren't always bad. And we're trying to lift the burden from licensees. Some of them yeah. might be here and might um, want to disagree with me on that. But when, you, when you're an organic farmer, you're not just having to do the job of the farming. You've got to keep all your records ready. for. You get inspected every year. Last year, we had to do it virtually, and now we're playing a game of catch-up uh, on a risk-based thing in order to... But you're still inspected. We know all the people. We get tens of thousands of phone calls in this office every year. Our certification team, I'm pointing, they're actually not in there. They were yesterday. They're back home working virtually. Our certification team know their farmers, so they pay... It starts at about 350 quid a year, goes up to about 1800 quid if you're on a really big farm. I can't remember the acreage, but there's a cap. Out of that, we pay an inspector and we pay a certification staff and we run the office. That's it. There's no money going to, I don't have a big car. I just about have a car. It's on a lease contract. They, that works. It's been working for decades. What's the problem? The other side of this is that they say, they say. DEFRA has said, and I think it's scandalous that they said it in the consultation preamble, they listed all their potential positives and nothing else. None of the language said, but these potentials may not happen. None of the language talked about where the pitfalls are and one of those pitfalls which we've already discussed when you do these things with CRISPR you have to patent it CRISPR itself is a patented tool and those patents or well, I've done a CRISPR version of whatever it is those are being bought up I've put in the chat mapping CRISPR those are being bought up guess who it's the same big companies, Cortiva, Bayer. Uh, these companies are not doing this for any other reason than profit motive. And surely profit motive alone is why we are in a mess with our biodiversity and the huge extinction rates and with climate change and the catastrophe of the recent COP. If, if we don't answer the question properly, we get criticised. If we answer the question properly, we spend a long time talking about all of this stuff when really I would sooner be talking about having a proper UK-wide crop breeding programme that is at least partly public funded. We've lost all of our crop breeding stations except for Ibers at Aberystwyth. 
it's yeah. it's it's appalling. Yeah, I think something that shows how strongly this is about you know making money for the big corporations is that if you talk about regulation, obviously as someone who's working in the seed industry, I can tell you that since Brexit, plant health regulation has actually increased, and the amount of checks that have to happen on importing seed has increased dramatically, which I think is largely a good thing. I actually, like you're saying, Stephen, there is a lot of strength actually in appropriate regulation. And we can see from things like Ash Dieback having come in that actually this is useful, but it's not even a philosophical point for the government in terms of deregulation because they're very happy to have deregulation when it doesn't benefit, you know, when it's not relevant. It's, it's, this is all about corporate lobbying and you know, money, ma money making essentially. Just having a quick look through here into the chat. Eviona saying we need natural resources Wales to show some commitment with this and to engage with Welsh government. Yeah, if there's any points. Yeah, well, don't hold your breath. There's obviously the. Uh, we did actually have people from NRW at this conference last year. I think it was last year. And um, yeah. I suppose one of the problems there is that these these sort of quangos or whatever they are don't really have any teeth or any resources to speak of. And one of the problems that we've got <laughs> is that all the money is being leached out of the food system through uh, ridiculously high land prices, a lack of ability for access for new entrants, etc. And those with a lot of money are then offshoring that resource and they're not investing back in. So, yeah, no, Evian is right. We should see that. But I don't think we will. We will. So, any other questions from the floor, the virtual floor, as it were? Just while you all have a think and perhaps type into the chat, I'd like to give a quick plug, if I could, the chair for a couple of things. So with the Landworks Alliance, we've got some in-person events coming up. Um, which is sort of linked to the Landworks Alliance AGM. There's one in Cardiff and one in North Wales. I'm just going to pop a link in the chat for those. But certainly at the Cardiff one, we're going to be talking in one of the workshops about GM and about, you know, what we can do in Wales and what sort of actions we should be taking. And I would urge all of you, hopefully this would... Oh, no, I've just sent that to Liz. It's a direct message. My apologies. Um, let's put, I'm going to put this in the chat. Sorry, I'm just going silent here. Um, but yes, lovely, lovely bit of multitasking going on. There. I know I'm failing here. <laughs> My computer, the computer says no, doesn't it? But anyway, I will try and send this all on to you. But the other thing I would urge you all to do is, if you can pass on your email addresses. Anyone who would like to be kept in touch with all of this, pop your email address in the chat, or definitely, as Liz said, if you can sign up to the GM freeze information, that will, you know, then we can all keep in touch with you. And when we can start taking action, start doing things, then why is my chat not working? Sorry, let's do this. Uh, what you're doing, uh, just, um, Jane Ricketts has just reminded me that we have a Padlet thing which I'm putting in the link. And ah, when I'm brilliant. out of here, uh, I will put some of the links that Liz and I put on here on that Padlet. Yes, I, I'm not attempting to do that while we're here because my computer doesn't like doing Zoom and a browser at the same time. Bad things happen. Um, oh, yes, and Jane's saying, how do we get more coverage? I mean, this is the question. I think the other thing that I would like to say and again, do, if you can come along to the Cardiff event, uh, particularly anyone who's a member of the Landwork Science, but actually it's open in general. I think Gerald, who I'm, su I'm surprised he's not here actually, which is, I think he was hoping to come, but obviously other things happened. I think there's gonna be some hope to get GM Free Cymru, the organization up and running again, because it seems like we do start, need to start taking action. Um, but yes, how do we get this coverage? Liz and Stephen, do we have any sort of thoughts on that? Liz? Yeah, I mean, I certainly have. Um, and, you know, when big things happen, we get a bit. Um, I actually got a slot on the BBC News, it used to be called News 24, I think it's just called BBC News TV channel now, isn't it? I'm showing my age there. Um, and so, you know, when big things happen, there, there's a little flurry. But the media is absolutely kind of 
biased against small single issue campaigning organizations now you know I, i've used the word bias they might just say you know they might put it another way but that is not what they want to have out there and most media other outlets follow you know follow the same kind of tone there is not a lot of appetite for getting sector specialists from the campaigning um point of view to get out there so you know we kind of it's a funny thing running a single issue um organization because people outside of, of our world quite often think that i'm just some kind of mad obsessive and that because the job that i do is running a single issue campaign i think that's the one and only and most important thing in the whole world and you know that's not how it is it's an organizational convenience that we have member organizations who chip some money in and that helps us run an organization and dedicate vast amounts of time to keeping up with the fine details where that falls down is when there is some media interest and big organizations won't talk about it so one of the limiting factors with with the media and the, exactly the same goes for government probably even more so maybe a bit less with the Welsh government i actually have a couple of people who email me which is very nice um, and it's much friendlier than the emails i have with defra um, but that same kind of sense that there's something a little bit off about single issue campaigns that they're just kind of going to be really extreme and they're, they're just a we've even we've even got a vested interest i mean believe me i don't make a lot of money out of this you know um so one of the things i think that everyone can do which is quite a kind of long-winded way around but please raise this issue with the big organizations that get the media coverage now i don't know like not very many people have got their organization on here and i suspect we're largely you know from very small organizations but you know if you're personally a member of the national trust the wi oh i so want the wi again they've been really active on gm way back but you know put it about raise your concerns in big organizations if you're a donor to, to, to really big charities make sure that you mention it in your communications with them they need to know that actually their constituency wants them to take this on board um so you know i i think yeah that's that's what i would say is one of my hows it's not the only how um we're also doing lots of work on framing and communications we're going to be publishing um some messaging guide details very very soon one of those big things is that phrase i've been using all or well what, what, the bit of morning and the bit of afternoon that we're having all of the session um is that you know gene editing is gm with better pr but there'll be sort of some more stuff like that that everyone can use um but we have to get it up the agenda of more generalist organizations because there's only so much that a specialist can ever do. Actually, can I just put a point in there, which is saying that I think all of us as farmers can talk about GM. And I think it's very important that as farmers, if we have the chance to talk to any of the various Fernio or any of these things that we are willing to talk about GM, I think it can be quite scary to talk about GM as a non-specialist because it's very easy to be accused of being anti-science. And I think, I don't know, perhaps I think both Stephen and Liz, you've both made some useful comments about how to address that from talking about the alternatives. But if either of you have any sort of quick comebacks, you know, people say, oh, you're just anti-science. You know, is there a way to avoid that as someone talking as a non-specialist about GM, you know, as a farmer particularly? I mean, I, I, would, I would certainly say that, you know, wanting things to be regulated is not anti-science. Wanting proper protections is is not remotely anti-science or even anti-technology it's a, actually about you know, regulation can be enabling because if you have somebody checking that it's only going to do all these wonderful things then it would have you know that then, then it, it would sorry sorry slightly different approach on that like you know one of the ways of framing regulation is if the these techniques are so amazing they'll sail through it they'll sail through the checks um but one that I do quite like bringing up is, is evolution, you know, and and ecology as strong science. So, you know, the idea that, that GM is actually isn't science, it's technology. 
Um, so the, it's not very scientific to ignore evolution and to ignore ecology. So that is maybe another way to kind of sidestep it. You know, farmers are great scientists. They might use slightly different language, but they're actually doing, you know, real real science, which is where you have a hypothesis, you know, you put it in the ground, you, you see what happens and you learn from it. That's, that's real science. I think there's also, there's a lot of um, cognitive dissonance, I think is the phrase, where you believe something, but you do something else in that you know is contrary to it, where farmers will say things like, well, the fertilizer price has gone up or, or the markets are depressed or whatever, but then not change what they're doing. And I think the shorter we can get supply chains and the more we can look each other in the eye, the better. I think one of the issues is that the news media prefer very simple messaging in order to attract an audience, which is why bad news sells, because it's easy to say house on fire rather than people have built a really nice house. So it's where we can sell those stories or sell them, I mean, in, in, in sort of paint a picture of where we are building good food systems together. We, to do that, we can, we can subvert the status quo. Andrew Whitley was on the um, food programme a little while ago. Andrew is the founder of Scotland the Bread, which is one of the greatest <laughs> names for a group I've ever heard of. Andrew is, I'm sure most people would agree, the godfather of sourdough in the UK. Andrew was baking sourdough commercially in the early 1970s, so he is about 400 years old now. Anyway, he developed a thing called Flower to the People, Flower spelled F-L-O-U-R, Last night, they were awarded the Food Programmes Award for producer or something, whatever it was, innovative producer. That project was getting organic whole grains grown, milled, baked to people who otherwise wouldn't be able to access them, whether it was through affordability or through just access to those trade routes. And guess what? It worked. And loads of people ate really well, and more people want to get involved, and it's building and building and building. So let's tell those good news stories as much as we possibly can. I think, I think you're really right, Steve. We do need to shout about the good news stories. But I think perhaps, and I think it's a slightly depressing point to make, is that all, probably all of us here spend a lot of our time telling good news stories. And I do at Real Seeds, you know, the joy of people loving to have open pollinated seeds and what they're doing with them but unfortunately I think at the moment we probably also do need to take action on the bad news because I think otherwise it's going to sneak up on us I mean I, I can see this we have friends in the United States who are fantastic so there's an amazing organic and speciality seed industry in the Willamette Valley in Oregon which has the perfect you would weep if you lived in Wales as a seed breeder if they have the most perfect climate and they have been having to conduct a battle against planting of GM canola and GM beet, which will contaminate their crops in their valley. For 10 years, they have been fighting this. And, you know, and they are the best news story you could imagine. They are employ people, they sell great seed or whatever. And they, but, you know, that doesn't stop this stuff being planted next door to them. And when it comes next door to them, you know, you can't avoid it as, as Liz made. So you both made the point, it cross pollinates. We can't ignore it and hope it will go away. No, absolutely. I agree. I, d I just find it so sometimes it puts people off because I don't know about you, but I find it quite literally frightening. Oh, yeah. And um, we can't, you know, the late great Peter Melchett is not with us anymore to put on his white jumpsuit and go and, and, you know, that kind of single issue campaigning, I'm sure Liz would agree, it's morphed, it's changed. We're a bit... I don't know, sophisticated is the wrong word. We're, we're busy on TikTok, or not, I am anyway. Um, I'm not, I'm not, my kids are. Uh, but we're very, it's very quick in and out. Uh, 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 and these things don't necessarily lend themselves to that. It's like um, the symbology of the, Liz has talked about this, of the scissors for GM, for new GMOs, 
they're molecular scissors. They don't look like scissors. What it is is an enzyme that they've taken from another organism. That doesn't look like scissors. I mean, it's a Petri dish with an enzyme in it, but they sell it as a pair of scissors. It's bizarre. I mean, you wouldn't be able to mend your clothes using this thing. Well, and actually, funnily enough, that, that you should mention that, you know, I don't know if this is going to work. I'm going to hold up to my camera um, the proof of the next issue of Thin Ice, which I've just signed off. It has a new picture in it. Can you see that? that it's a new picture that we've just developed. Um, we've got a chainsaw instead of the scissors. I right. get so mad about the scissors. Like they don't like they were talking, oh, it, it's this CRISPR technique that you know the the, the it was. I mean, it's a great media story. It was developed by two women. They won a Nobel Prize. You know, there's a lot that the media love about it. They're both quite camera friendly, you know. And this idea that it's the genetic scissors that's used all the time. It rips the DNA apart. It doesn't snip anything. It rips it to pieces. And then it relies on the cell's own repair mechanism, hopefully putting it back together in a kind of helpful way. You know, so it's it's not this kind of terribly precise thing. And they use these images that make it look a bit like molecular microsurgery. And I think we, we all really absorb those things. And so we think, oh, yeah, yeah, but you know, that can't be that bad because it, they're, they're just changing, they're just taking a little bit out and they're putting another bit in. No, they're not. They're mixing shed loads of chemicals up in a test tube in a petri dish and seeing what happens. They think maybe they'll be able to, to uh, you know, change this very particular part of the genome because they're using the, the very targeted um, enzymes and other chemicals. But, you know, th they're not putting it under the biggest, most powerful microscope you've ever seen in the world. You know, they're, they're mixing it all up. So it, it, and I think it's really, really important to kind of just break through some of that mythology, which is partly why I'm investing in new pictures. I'm thinking of also doing one with a hand grenade. So if anyone's got any thoughts on that, send them over. Um, Kate was on, was was at our AGM where we were playing with some of this stuff. So she you seen the evolution live and direct. Um, and no, yeah. really welcome input. <laughs> It is really interesting. So I don't know if any of you have read the biography. There's a very, actually a very good biography of Jennifer Doudna called The Code Breaker, which talks all about the development of CRISPR. And it's actually absolutely fascinating about patenting and the legal stuff or whatever. And it's a wonderful book, which actually I would recommend people to read, but it does not talk about farming at all. It talks about the use of this stuff in medicine, where obviously, you know, there can be fantastic things achieved to help people who have terrible diseases. Um, and it talks about the ethics of gene germline editing and CRISPR babies, doesn't mention farming. You know, and I find that absolutely fascinating because where are people going to make money on this thing? It's going to be on farming, isn't it? And yet it's never mentioned. So, yeah, I don't know. Well, just, just as a passing word, because we're coming up to one o'clock, but Sorry. Um, I was on a round table with Michael Gove looking at GM a few years ago, it was when he was DEFRA secretary, and Ottoline Laser was there, who's now the person in charge of UKRI, United Kingdom Research and Innovation. They, they get all of the public money, the, the, our money, taxpayers' money from the Treasury that goes to this sort of research, goes through Ottoline's uh, organisation. And Ottoline said to me, said to us, this won't necessarily even be for her. She was talking about crisper gas. She said, we've got the tech. We want to sell it around the world. So for her, it was to uplift the lives of people around the world. And for the business is involved, it was about a return on investment. End yeah. of. And we've seen what has happened with, you know, the Green Revolution technologies and who has really suffered from those. I think it's really important to remember that actually the suffering there has has been around the world and particularly in poorer countries, hasn't it? And if anybody has the chance to read The Long Green Revolution by Raj Patel, because The Green Revolution wasn't just about plant breeding, it was about chemicals and irrigation. Yeah. Uh, I think we are coming up to one o'clock here. Just. I think we've probably covered everything in the chat. If anyone feels that their question hasn't been picked up, if you could just retype it in case I've missed it, but I'm hoping, I think we've probably got everything there. 
asking. Thank you very much, everyone. Yes. Thank you so much to our two fantastic speakers. Um, and I'm hoping that everyone is feeling really well informed and ready to go out and put on their white boiler suits and, you know, pull up crops or do whatever needs to be done. <laughs>